by busting up big business to make a nation of small capitalists. But that meant taking from the rich and giving to the poor, which upset conservatives in the United States. What a landslide. Reports at Republican headquarters in Washington soon show that it's bigger even than expected. The Republicans won control of Congress in, in the fall elections in 1946, and there was some concern among conservatives in this country that the land reform, that the uh, breaking up of the Zaibatsu, that the purges were having a negative effect on property rights. And they were complaining that this was much too radical, moving in the direction of socialism. Washington's growing distrust of MacArthur and the SCAP reformers soon began to circulate in the U.S. press. It indicated that the occupation was in the hands of mindless leftists who were uh, making Japan very vulnerable to communism, chaos, perhaps even anarchy. Inside SCAP, a division was growing between those who wanted to maintain democratic reforms and hardline anti-communists who wanted to build up the country. The division in the headquarters became known to the Japanese and they took advantage uh, of that division of opinion uh, to try uh, to sabotage the reforms that were suggested to them by the government section. Inside MacArthur's headquarters, there were these new dealers and other leftists. We saw these people and worried that they were trying to turn Japan into a kind of socialist country. Afraid of general strikes and other signs of chaos around us, we moved to keep Japan from turning red. Japanese and American conservatives joined forces to undermine some of the earlier reforms. They sought to rebuild Japanese big business under the guidance of elite bureaucrats and politicians. It was called the reverse course, moving away from what Yoshida called the excesses of democracy. It was a pity that the emphasis was shifted when it was shifted uh, because there was no internal menace from the Communist Party in Japan whatsoever. In 1948, the United States officially adopted a new plan, build up Japanese industry. Japan would become the workshop of Asia in the fight to contain communism. Shigeru Yoshida rejoiced. A month after the occupation changed course, so did the course of Japanese politics. In 1948, Japanese voters, looking for stability and economic growth, swept Yoshida and the Japanese conservatives into power. They are still in power today. By the end of 1949, Japan began a new purge, the Red Purge, to root out the communists SCAP had set free four years before. There is a bird called the Tanchozu. It's a sacred crane with a red head and a white body. That bird was like the Japanese labor movement. The leadership was red, but not the body. The rank and file workers were rather moderate. So when the red head was chopped off, the labor movement lost its radical direction. Japanese managers also used the Red Purge in their battle against labor unions. I was not a communist, but I came close to being purged because I was a union leader. During the Red Purge, many people who were not communists lost their jobs simply because they took a hard line toward management. Official policy toward labor unions had changed. When the Toho Movie Union tried to occupy the studio and run it themselves, the police broke down the studio gates. They were backed up by American tanks and airplanes. With the unions in check, the U.S. sent a new emissary to remake Japan's economic policy. On February 1st, 1949, a Detroit banker named Joseph Dodge arrived in Tokyo. 
he was given total authority to fix Japan's economy. To Dodge, the main problem was obvious, inflation. Money was losing its value. For this, Dodge had a simple banker solution, balance the budget. Inflation stopped dead in its tracks. I still remember, uh, oh, 10 months after Dodge policy put into effect, there was a newspaper news that some uh, burglars took money instead of goods. Which, uh, Mr. Dodge was visibly pleased to know the story, that money is now getting some, some worth. But for workers, the cure seemed worse than the disease. Dodge had cut government subsidies to balance the budget. Without government funds, thousands of firms went bankrupt. In 1949, public and private companies laid off over two million workers. Union leaders were the first to go. Economic conditions inflamed political passions. Newspaper headlines were filled with news of mysterious murders and political sabotage. The Yoshida government promised recovery, but the Dodge line was mocking his promises of economic prosperity. Yoshida called it a gift from the gods. It was the Korean War. North Korea, backed by the Soviet Union, invaded South Korea, backed by the United States. The Americans bought their trucks and supplies from Japan. The Japanese called it divine aid. That really boosted the Japanese economy, which had been under severe recession. So that I think the real success of Dodge policy was helped by this Korean War, no doubt about it. For a country trying to rebuild, the infusion of cash from the Korean War effort was as important as giving milk to a baby. The Korean War boosted the Japanese economy, but it also allowed the Japanese people to forget about what Japan did to Asia in World War II. It was the beginning of a new ethic in Japan. If it makes money, it's good. Between 1950 and 54, the U.S. spent nearly $3 billion in Japan for military supplies. It was called the procurement boom. It jump-started Japan's economy and saved the regime of Shigeru Yoshida. In 1951, Prime Minister Yoshida flew to the United States to make a deal. Yoshida wanted Japan's independence. Americans wanted Japan to rearm and side with America in the Cold War. To San Francisco went Times' Frank Gibney to interview Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida. He must have been a word rather stuffy. He was, in every sense, a general of the old school. But he was the only Japanese statesman of that day who was willing and capable of standing up to the Americans and holding out for what he thought Japan should be. Yoshida resisted American pressure to rearm because he was afraid military spending would damage Japan's fragile economy. What Mr. Yoshida said was that after the peace treaty is concluded, though Japan will certainly have its political independence, Japan must then definitely get its economic independence to go with this. We didn't realize that Mr. Yoshida, his finance minister, Mr. Ikeda, and others we're already planning uh, the new economic Japan. Nine years, nine months, and one day since Pearl Harbor and the bloody Pacific War that ensued, delegates from 52 nations convene in San Francisco's Opera House to conclude a treaty of peace with Japan. A little more than Yoshida signed a peace treaty giving Japan the independence it desired in exchange for allowing the U.S. to keep its military bases on Japanese soil. But many Japanese feared the U.S. would lead Japan into another war. We felt betrayed that our democratic society was marred from the start. This happened solely for the sake of American self-interest. 
Initially, there were lofty ideals of remaking Japan into a forefront nation for democracy and global peace. But by the early 